Well, Mr. Mayor, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my name is Peter Bolt. I think most of you will know me from Conservation Areas Will, or as we are better known as CORE. Um, I am uh, responsible for the, all the work involved with the blue plaques. Um, when we first started on this, which was about two and a half years ago, uh, Wirral had, I think it was about five, dotted round. And it was David Ball who said to me, look, he said, I'd like to, uh, uh, I have a bit of money in the Heritage Fund. Um, Treasure is there any words. way, any chance <laughs> you can do it? <laughs> he Sorry, hasn't Dick. now. He, would, you, it, Glenn, would you like to do a rolling program of four, uh, yeah. So he said, yeah, we'd, we'd be very pleased to do that. So we started doing that. Um, if I were to tell you now, we've actually done 16. And you don't have to be a mathematician to realize well, where do the other come from. Well, the others are from private subscription. And where people would come to us and said, look, um, once our, once our uh, four had been used, uh, they wanted us to be involved in this. They wanted their organisation to do something. So yeah, the 16 in, this is the 17th. Um, it's particularly pertinent, this one being a lady. Uh, we, we're, a, we're a little bit down on ladies for blue flags. And the second one that we did was uh, uh, Anne Davison. Anne Davison lived at Meerbrook House in uh, Raven, and she was the first lady to sail single-handed across the Atlantic, which is a tremendous feat. And we're talking about a boat which is about 21 feet, uh, 25, 21 feet long. She was a great adventurer. She had a pilot license. And uh, she also used to manage the uh, the Hooton uh, Aerodrome in Montana. She was she was a great lady. Um, and the nice thing about that, a booklet was produced for that unveiling, and this seems to have carried on uh, because people say, well, that's a good idea. I think we might do a booklet on this. And the second lady we did was um, Anne, uh, Anne Mercer, first Lady Mayor of Birkenhead. I think she was the third in the, the country. Um, and now we have uh, Agnes Maud Lloyden. We've also done, um, uh, what was the name of the lady? Edith Smith. Edith Smith. Oxton, the first lady warranted police officer in the United Kingdom. Really needed some celebrating, so she's uh, she's gone. In. Um, I'm hoping uh, the other suffragette lady, Alice Kerr. Um, I, w I would love to take her home forward this year. Unfortunately, the house is up for sale. So you re because we need to get permission from the owner, we've got to sort all that out first, and then we can go ahead. So, here we are. We're up to Maud. I know little about Maud, so I'm going to invite Mike Boyden to say a few words on Maud. Thanks a lot. Hello, um, yeah, Mike Boyden. Uh, I've been a historian of the family for quite some time. In fact, it started when I was at school. I was given a, a history homework to say, uh, do your family tree, bring it in ne next week. That's the longest homework I've ever had because I'm still doing it. Um, and in fact, it, it's going to accumulate this year. We've got, I've got a book. This is not a shameless plug, by the way, but the, there's a book about the family and the hall and board, and it's coming out this year, but it's been about 40 years in the making. So um, so I'm really excited now about, about that. And Hill Bar, of course, that, that, that. Um, and uh, for, for uh, so uh, 
Maud, uh, she wasn't actually born here. She lived in uh, uh, Homefield House over in uh, Mossley Hill. Uh, and the, the original owner of the house here was, was Thomas Royden. He was the one who founded the yard. Um, he was a carpenter. He, he saw the Liverpool growing as a port and he went over there and started off a business um, eventually. And that's where the family fortune came as he came back and systematically bought up um, all the land in, you know, in the Frankby area, created the estate and the home, and the home was built. Um, but the son, Thomas Bland Royden, was still managing the business over in uh, Liverpool and he had, a, he had various homes over there through a period of time, eventually gradually moving out into the suburban area. And then when he got to the Mosley Hill area, that's where he had his family, there were eight children and Maud was the youngest um, um, of eight. Uh, and I read about how it must have been quite, it was vibrant discussions around the dining table each night about politics and all sorts of things. And Maud is actually becoming more of a, a sort of a socialist, even in those early days, in stark contrast to the rest of the family. Um, so you can imagine what the discussions uh, must have been like. Um, but they realised that she, she was a bright girl and she was sent off to uh, Cheltenham to the college, the ladies, uh, the, the, the girls' college there, Lady Margaret Hall. And she was educated there, and then she persuaded her parents to send her to Oxford. Now, this was 1893 or thereabouts, which was quite a step at the time. Now, she could she could attend Oxford University, and the way she went, and she could study and do her exams, but she wasn't awarded a, a, a degree because only the men were awarded degrees um, at that time. So, you can imagine how that rankled with her um, at the time, and how other how, uh, girls were on the same courses were feeling uh, quite the, uh, the same way. She came back here and she uh, she returned to the family home. By this time it is here, father had retired. And uh, she she then was getting quite restless, as you can imagine, not wanting to sort of go into open uh, flower shows or unveil blue, blue, blue plaques. She, she would rather be doing something very useful in, in life. So off she went to the Liverpool Women's Settlement uh, over in uh, Everton Hill. If you know where the lockup is on the Everton Badge, it's just a bit further along, but it was working in the slum areas, court housing and you know, down in the Scotland Road area. She'd already worked in a mission when she was in uh, Oxford, so she had a taste of that, which is why she wants to go there. So she spent 18 months there and obviously seeing another side of life entirely. Uh, following that, uh, she, she then, through friends in Oxford, uh, met up with the Reverend Hudson Shaw, and he was going to change her life, and they became lifelong friends. And that was the beginnings of it. He invited her back to Oxford, and his wife was disabled, and uh, he invited her to be a carer uh, for his wife, but also he set, set up the Oxford Extension Studies Department, like we have now in Liverpool Uni for continuing education. I lectured there for uh, 20 years, but that, but that was that was a pioneering uh, way of getting things in there for adult education um, at Oxford um, at the time, and I think he had designs on moving her in. And that didn't take long, and soon she was lecturing them in English um, in the university. But she was still with her friends down there, and they were still keen on the growing suffrage movement. She wasn't actually a suffragette that was mentioned. She was, she was a su suffragist, so she wasn't uh, active marching. And she was actually born with dis dislocated hips. And so she had a really... It wasn't effective treatment in, in, the, in those days. And so she was... Uh, she, she was rather restricted about going out on the marches, that sort of thing. But she was a thinker, a philosopher. She wrote a great deal. She did the speeches. Um, and so she was asked to talk at a great many places. And she raised the profile um, um, in that way. And so she was very active then, right up to the First World War. And things obviously took a back seat for um, a few, few years. But she was a pacifist also. And this is the time when the, the, the group had split, hadn't it? You all know about the Pankhurst and so on. That was a group that split away for more militant actions. This is why she was never involved in the, the more publicised actions of you know, chaining to railings, as we all know, and you know, breaking uh, the, uh, the artworks and put an axe through it, all this sort of thing. So she wasn't involved um, in that. But at the, at the end of the war, once the vote was granted, and still not to everybody, of course, you had to be, uh, it, it was 1928 before uh, all, all the women of uh, 21 and over had the vote. So it was a restricted voter uh, in 1980. She was then invited down to London again by Reverend Hudson Shaw. Sure, he'd, he'd moved down there to become um, a vicar in a parish and he invited her to preach. Now this again was a pioneering step as you can imagine. 
Now this started confrontation from then on with the authorities, the church authorities who had tried to chase her out of town, banned her wherever she was there speaking, but made her even more and more determined. And she, she continued to preach in the guild hall and a, a, a associated uh, places. And it, they, were, they were full audiences. They were, they were queuing, I've got account, newspaper accounts describing how they queued around the block fighting to get into here, which is, which is incredible. Whether it was curiosity value at that stage, you know, maybe. But she soon made a name for herself um, as a speaker um, at that time. Uh, she later became the uh, first woman to preach in the cathedral in 1926. Um, she adopted uh, uh, two babies, two war bit, bit babies, which they were all doing at that time. Pankhurst had four. Uh, but in those days, of course, there were less restrictions. Um, uh, but by the, the end of the 20s, she then launched herself on a lecture tour and she went uh, to America, uh, to Australia, New Zealand, China, Japan, all over the place, preaching, uh, spe uh, uh, public speaking all over the place. But she was, re she was received by the Prime Ministers, the Rockefellers in America. Uh, you know, she was, uh, Gandhi was a close friend of hers. So these are the circles that she moved as well as, you know, into, in places like Liverpool Women's Settlement. She was just as comfortable in, in, in both. Um, in the, in the, uh, the, the 30s, she was then started to be recognised by the establishment. Uh, she, was, uh, she was awarded a, a doctorate by Glasgow and Liverpool. She was awarded the Companion of Honour. Uh, that was uh, also a uh, brother, Sir, Sir Tom. Uh, he, was, he was chairman of Cunard Line at the time, and he was awarded the Companion of Honour for work he did during the First World War. So the only, the only brother and sister to ever hold the office any one time. There's only 65 people, but somebody has to die before, you, uh, before the award won again, you know. It's, it's still like that now. Uh, and so that was uh, in, the, in the 30s where she uh, was on, still on the pacifist cause. By 1940, she did an about turn because of the Nazi uh, threat, of course, and she upset a great many of her followers, but she deemed that Nazism was a cause worth fighting for, of course. Um, but she was again getting into her later years, and in the 40s, she then moved into a cottage next door to her old friend Hudson Shaw, um, and she was really wants to look after the, the pair of them. And this was a kind of a blessed relationship, you know, Effie, Hudson's wife, it was a, it was sort of a three, Strong sort of a relationship. Um, well, Effie passed away in '44, and within weeks, Maud had married uh, Hudson Shaw. They'd waited 43 years. Um, they must have gone out with a bang because he was dead within eight, eight, eight weeks. <laughs> and she was 68, and he was 85. Oh my God. Well, at least they, they got together there at the end. She wrote about it that in 1947, uh, there was a book called Three Fold Cord which is a lovely, uh, loves the story about the three, three of them. Um, she continued to write, uh, and then she appeared on radio a great deal, and w w Women's Hour uh, was going at the, in those, at those early days. Um, then she passed away in 1956, so quite a pioneering little, little lady. And uh, the family are still very interested. Her daughter, a granddaughter from the adopted child, she lives in Shropshire, and her nephew, or the great-grandson, lives in New Zealand. And they came over and came to my house in uh, about four years ago. They brought a book of Maud's they gave me, which was signed by, which was tre treasured, um, documents, photos, and the shellac records from the you know, 78s, but a Maud speaking on the radio. I'd never heard a voice before, so it was just wonderful uh, uh, to hear that. Um, they brought the Companion of Honour in the case. I had a photograph taken with it, I had to give it back. So, uh, so that was nice. And then we came here. So, the, so they came to see the hall, and I've got photos of them outside here and Hill Park, of course, um, across the way. So that was that was the uh, that's the direct line. Um, also, uh, we have Sir, Sir John Royden, who's the current baronet, and he's the direct descendant. He's a great great nephew of Maud. He's a direct descendant of Ernest, her brother, who had uh, hit Hill Park, um, and he 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 came along um, as well. Uh, last October we were made guests, uh, Dominga organised this and we, we were made guests of Hill Bark, we had a cracking weekend, uh, absolutely uh, magnificent and we came here as well, had the, the photos taken here, we knocked on the door to see Joe but he was out so he escaped, work, <laughs> <laughs> so we escaped there, we were going to come in for a drink, you know, the whole, the whole tour 
Uh, but John has actually sent a message. I, I was emailing him uh, earlier on in the week, and we've put it in the in the booklet. Um, so I just re read out what he said. He said, she's great, great to me, but also to the world at large. Her life was great on so many counts. More came from the well-known rich and privileged Royden family who had built the fortunes of the booming Liverpool shipbuilding trade of the 19th century. She avoided indulging a life with the trivial pleasures that wealth afforded in the roaring 20s. Instead, she chose to spend her life trying to make the world a better place for all by working hard to enrich the lives of women with a journey that still continues today in terms of building equality for women. She also tried her hardest to elevate the dialogue around the subject of sex away from the Victorian concept that it was little more than the sins of the flesh. Her book Sex and Common Sense broke taboos and was a pioneering publication in its day. Her plaque is more than a memory of Maud Droyden, would be an inspiration for all of us who follow in her steps and try to a greater or lesser degrees to make the world a better place for all of humanity. I hope it spurs us all on to greater achievements in our own lives and in, and in the lives of, of, of others. I'd just like to finish by just thanking people who have come along here today to take the tr trouble and uh, to come and attend, but also, of course, they're the, they're the people who um, have been involved there in this. Um, it's nice to see a few familiar faces as well. There's Mike, Mike Curtis, who's given me, I think he says he's hiding in the shade at the moment. Yeah. Where is, he's over there, Mike. He's given me a lot of stuff in the past about their history um, of the area, so it's good, good to, see, to see, see Mike. Uh, Elizabeth Davy, is she here? She's in jail now. Elizabeth, <laughs> yeah, not, nice, nice to see, see you. We've exchanged emails and messages and the great book on Birkenhead that you've done. Uh, Dominga, who's come over from uh, Hill, Hill Bark, who I mentioned uh, uh, before. Um, uh, Andy McCluskey, of course, from the Frankly Conservation Group and various other things he does in his spare time. <laughs> I'm lucky enough to live in a right Yeah, I was about to say, <laughs> Maud's si sister's house um, as well. And, uh, I wish I brought them together. <laughs> I, I was in Enix in, in 81 and uh, I, I worked for Rock Roger Eagle, so we might, we might have a chat about that. Um, but yeah, so it's good, good to see you. Uh, happy birthday, by the way. Was yeah. it a big one? A big one? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, all, all, the, all the best, but thanks for coming, for coming along. Um, and the plaque has been kindly funded by Wirral Council. Uh, Lucy Barrow uh, was uh, working on that. She's Assistant Director of Culture, Heritage and uh, to, to, uh, Tourism where money has, has come from. Uh, ably supported, of course, by, by Peter Bolt, um, who's in charge of the, uh, the Widow Blue plaque scheme. Uh, David Howard, over there, Sexton. Thank you for coming along. Friends of Franklin Cemetery, all there, thank you. Um, added support from Arlene Wilshaw, Heritage Officer for Wirral, Alan Creevy, Wirral Council Communication and Engagement Manage <laughs> Manager, and uh, councillors. I don't know, how, I've not been introduced to everybody. I'm not sure if everyone's here. Tom Anderson, David Burgess, Joyce, and Wendy Clements. Wendy Clements. And so, yeah. thanks to uh, to all of you. Uh, I'd like to thank in particular uh, Joe Joe Han Hanik, who's uh, he's lived here for nearly 30 years and a custodian of the place with his wife, and uh, he's worked tirelessly to get this thing off the ground. We've exchanged many emails over the years um, of all sorts of things about history, and he's given me guided tours around. And uh, so, it, it's down to him. Where, and, with his uh, work to uh, push the, the, this along. So um, th thank, thank you all, I'm so touched. It's, it's, it's a great day, thanks. And I now hand over uh, to, uh, uh, to the Mayor, uh, to do the honours, Councillor Tony Smith. Thank you. Well, Mike, thank you very much for that. That was really, really interesting and that to be able to uh, it was to dance. Sorry, it, it, no, it, it, was, it, it was excellent. And uh, obviously, congratulations to all the people who have uh, Um, so I'm delighted as the um, civic head of the council. Uh, I hope I am on the right side here. Yeah. I would suggest you stand that side. I'll pull it towards you. Okay. Take the left hand there. Okay. Okay. And um, so I'd like to unveil this blue flag celebrating the life and achievements of Agnes Maud Ryden, Ryden yeah, and funded by World Council as part of its 2019 World Culture Programme uh, with the help and support of conservation areas for Beautiful. That's it. Good.